Gracious Heavenly Father, I just come into your presence once again by means of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit, thankful for the opportunity that you've given us to gather together and feast upon your word. I just ask that you would filter out any foolishness or ignorance with seal to our hearts that which is truth. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. It's nighttime here in southeastern Oklahoma. In these videos, we've been studying together in the Epistle to the Romans, verse by verse. And in our last study together, I believe we've traveled up to verse 19 of the 8th chapter, Romans chapter 8 verse 19 well, we've seen a lot since we have began studying this epistle we've seen that through the finished work of Christ that we who have sinned and, and fell short of the glory of God have been justified freely without a cause and that we have been made righteous in Christ justified by faith we've been made the very righteousness of God in Christ and that through no merit of our own, so that we stand before him faultless, blameless. Uh, we are born from above. We're God's children by birth, not by adoption, but by birth. That we're sons by adoption, but we're children by birth. Born by the will of God, John 1.13. And we found in the 8th chapter that it's through our Lord Jesus Christ that we have victory in that wretched conflict that exists between flesh and spirit, between the old man and the new man, the unchangeable old man and the sinless new man. Beginning at verse 19, for the earnest expectation of the creature, the text says, creature waiteth, waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. For the creature was made subject to vanity not willingly, but by reason of him who hath subjected the same in hope, because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. If we go on reading in verse 22, for we know that the whole creation groans and travails in pain together until now. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves, groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of our body. The word creature uh, there in the text is referring to creation. We know that because if we go on, we see that we're not the creature or we're not the creation. If it was subject to vanity, in verse 20, the normal Greek word for vanity, empty, is basically what the word means. This is metalosis, and it means not accomplishing that for which it was designed to accomplish. The creation was designed for us, for you and me. It's, it, was, it was created to serve us. It was designed for man. So we are seeing evidence of the curse. The, the creation wasn't subjected to that by any uh, design of its own or any purpose of its own or any fault of its own. It was not subjected willingly. But it was done by the design, by the reason of him who subjected it in hope, is what the text says. The earnest expectation of the creation waits for the manifestation of the sons of God. Eagerly awaits, according to the original text, that one word in the original text. It was made subject to to not completing what it was designed to do by the reason of him who subjected it. But he did it in hope. 
Uh, the word is a dative in the sphere of hope because the creation itself, that's the plant and animal creation, separate from men. There's a vast difference between you and, and any other part of the normal creation, despite what science might try to persuade you to believe, is, you know, man and ape. The plant and animal creation was subjected to fruitlessness. I want you to understand it. This it was subjected to fruitlessness by the design of the Almighty God who did it. It was part of the curse. It was part of a res it was a result of the fall. It was part of the curse that the woman would look to her husband. It's part of the curse that the man would would labor by the sweat of his brow, make a living, uh, and go about it a very hard way. When God used to provide it freely, totally, by reason of the creation or through the creation. But we're told in verse 21, as we in chapter 7 receive victory between flesh and spirit, I want you to get this, just as we receive victory between the old man and the new man, so the creation itself will be delivered. Both were subject by God. For this purpose, it's a it's a future passive. The creation itself shall be delivered. It's a future indicative passive. The passive says that it's God who did it. The future indicative says it's certain, absolutely certain, and it's God's plan. There's no chance of change. No chance whatsoever of change. So, so much for the Green New Deal. Well, maybe I shouldn't have said that. I'm determined not to bring politics into this stuff, but it was in God's sovereign plan. This has been determined, and nothing man does can change it. It's all been determined by God. It will happen, and it will happen in God's time. It was it was subjected to vanity. You know, it was God determined the fall. And God has a, an appointed time for its deliverance. We are not going to cut it short, okay? If you rely on modern science, the, you know, the, the ultimate end of everything is chaos. You know, everything goes to decay. You know, the, the law of, of, what is it they call it? Entropy or whatever. Everything is leading toward decay. But that fails to factor God into the equation. Our text says God will deliver his creation from the bondage of decay. The, the word in the original text is the word decay. The bondage or corruption or decay is, is a good illustration of the, of the fruitlessness of creation under the curse. I hope you're getting this. There's a great similarity between Adam and, and the conflict. In the flesh and spirit but it will be delivered from that absolutely by the design of the sovereign God into the glorious liberty of the children of God so creation finds its freedom through that deliverance the new man finds its freedom in that deliverance children of God which I believe speaks of our intimate relationship with with him because of the finished work of Christ. We're not only his sons, but we are his children. The uh, idea of, of being a son speaks of a legal relationship, a family inheritance type relationship. But a child sp speaks of the love and the fellowship of the, of the loving Heavenly Father with his own. The glorious liberty of the children of God. That liberty, folks, is yours now. But there is a portion of you where that is not true. We're, we're awaiting the uh, redemption of our body. We're eagerly looking forward to the redemption of our body. And that's where the subject of adoption comes in. We'll, we'll look at that in just a moment. I touched a little bit on that in our last video. For we know that the whole creation groans and travails together, the text says, in pain until now. We look at 
the design of the sovereign God and creation we're not we're, we look at how the creation failed but we're not to fault creation but you know it's another blow against modern science it, it was it was God's design it was by design of the supreme sovereign God of the universe that the curse settle both upon creation as well as, as man the plant and animal world as well as upon Adam and Eve it was God's design that he might show, he had a purpose in it, that he might show his wrath against sin. He couldn't have done it any other way. It was God's design that he might show his, his mercy on vessels of mercy and that he might show his glory, God's glory. So there's a, a purpose, there's a, there is design, there is direction. For we know that the whole creation groans and travails in pain together until now. The reason it's translated that way, because the Greek word is the word for childbirth. There is, is pain, just, as, just like we say, oh, wretched man I am, and we want to be delivered from this body of sin and death, or who shall deliver us through Jesus Christ our Lord. There, there is suffering in childbirth. But there's also the anticipation of the child. And so the God of all comfort is telling us that this tribulation, the results of this curse, lead to a deliverance similar to that of childbirth. In fact, well, this is the term he uses, is childbirth, travail. And when we have the privilege of holding that child in our hands, think of how he... Our Heavenly Father must feel. For we know, we know, the word is oida in the Greek, it's it's not gnosko, it's, it's not knowledge that is obtained by experience, that's gnosko. It's oida, the perfect knowledge. The big argument in verse 22 among uh, theologians is, is whether the we there in the text are just, is that just the apostles? You know, or is it a is it a poetic expression? Uh, is it only Paul? Is, is Paul the only one that knows this? Or are the apostles the only ones that, that knew this? Or is the we all inclusive? Are these all members of the body of Christ who know this? First of all, the word avoid is in the perfect tense, so, so we know in the past, with the result being that we now know it completely, that the whole creation groans and travails in pain together until now. That knowledge can only be ours by revelation. It isn't something that Paul learned. It's, it's, it's not knowledge gained on the, on the part of Paul. It's the Holy Spirit who is talking to us. I believe that most modern preachers today, they detract from the authority and the power of the Word of God, trying to uh, wrestle with Paul's reasoning, Paul's logic, trying to figure out what was going on in Paul's head. Folks, it's not Paul. Paul was a well-trained individual. But Paul is giving us the Word of God. God authored this text. Paul merely held the pen. The Holy Spirit says we know. We know perfectly that the whole creation groans and travails in pain together until now. Together. How do we know that? We're going to see by the time we get to verse... 24, the authorized version, regrettably says, we're saved by hope. This is for you King James Version only people out there. It says we're saved by hope. The original text clearly says that we are saved for hope. The word is for in the Greek. How do we know the whole creation is, is anticipating a birth, a deliverance into something much greater and more wonderful. How do we know that? How do we know that? By this book. By the Word of God. 
please don't tell me you know it because you dreamed it or because the Holy Spirit spoke to you or because you saw it on a billboard or read it on a license plate. Our hope is in the Word of God. Our knowledge is in the Word of God. It's how we know. The Word is no. Many times people over the years have asked me, well, how does the Spirit, you know, bear witness with my spirit that I'm a child of God? How do I know that? In the Word. It's the Holy Spirit that leads you as you study. If you don't study His Word, it's very difficult for the Holy Spirit to give you any knowledge. It's, it's very difficult for Him to bear witness with your spirit of that what He says is true, or that what someone says is true, that is of Him. The we know is in is in this book. Uh, we know the we know. Okay, uh, folks, look, we're we're to study to show ourselves approved workmen that need not be ashamed. This this knowledge is not something that we drummed up, that we dreamed up. This knowledge isn't something that will come to us over the years. You know, as we uh, as we study creation. As we look at the creation, that's that's basically what science has done, and it's as you know, it's drawn all the wrong conclusions, or most most of the wrong conclusions. This knowledge comes to us through God's word. A leading theologian can read the scriptures and say, "Well, I, I don't really think that Christ was crucified, uh, or I don't think that he was buried in any tomb around Jerusalem." Most of the times when they crucified uh, criminals, the Roman soldiers, they well, they just they'd take the bodies down and they'd they'd throw them into an unmarked grave. You know, they'd bury the bodies in nondescript graves. In fact, you may even be a, a you know you may be a Muslim who doesn't believe Christ was crucified at all. You know, it just turned out to be a hoax, turn or or it turns out to be a trick. It was. It was really Judas. Turned out to be Judas that they crucified. They made a mistake, and Christ kept, he slipped away. You don't believe that if the Holy Spirit is in you. For an individual to, for a guy to sit in my living room and say, "Well, man, if we could just find Noah's Ark, you know, it'd be the greatest." evangelistic step forward in human history. you got to be kidding. Why? He said, well, the people would know. You know, the people would know that there was an ark. I said, I know there was an ark. He says, well, how do you know? And this is a Christian, mind you. How do you know? How can you be sure of that? I said, because God said so. This man professed to be a Christian. It says, it says that in this book, it says it right here in God's Word. Are you telling me that a piece of rotten wood is more important in this book? That any arche archaeological discovery holds a candle to the Word of God? In my earlier years, many times as I traveled around the country, you know, uh, I would hear sermon after sermon after sermon, which discredited the power and the 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 reality, the truthful honesty of this book. I can I can remember recall someone in scripture here, uh, uh, Uzzah, I believe, you know, reached out, touched a stick of wood, and he died instantly. Yeah, I believe that. Sure, I believe that. I believe that God thundered from the mountain. I believe there was a flood. I believe that Jonah was in the belly of a giant carp. Okay, that was a joke. All right, a great fish. Absolutely, I believe that. I don't believe I don't believe it because I've investigated. I haven't done that. I, I I don't believe it because I've made any scientific study on the matter. 
I just believe it because God said it. I had a Christian tell me he finally came to believe that a great fish could actually swallow a, a man whole and, and, and the man could live. You could he, he could live inside the belly of that fish and then be vomited out because by scientific discovery, he had located a, a fish large enough to do that. And, and he had learned that, in fact, that this had actually happened. It had actually occurred and that someone had actually uh, gone through that experience. It did happen one time. And, and, I, and I'm, I'm like, and that impressed you? Let me, let me tell you what impresses me. I read the book of Jonah and his spirit bore witness with my spirit that that's true. There isn't any scientific discovery on the size of a whale's throat or a shark's belly or a shark's throat or, or anything like that that would impress me at all, but God's Word does. We know, we know it because of this book. What is our hope? Our blessed hope. Do you have some nondescript hope or, or do you have a hope based on the truth of this book? We know, the text says, and, and the word know there is that it's, it's a perfect tense. We absolutely know because God said so. God revealed it. But as it is written, I hath not seen nor ear heard neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. You all know that verse. And what's the last part? But God has revealed it to us by his spirit. We know. We absolutely know. Because we have this book. We know because we have the word of God. And folks, this book is being attacked on every side in in our lifetime, in our at, at this present time in particular. There were many years where the, this Bible was it was actually the Holy Bible because it was set apart in the Church of Jesus Christ, and in the attacks, at least most of the attacks, came from outside the church. But now, the great attacks against the Word of God come from within the so-called church. We've gone contemporary, not orthodox. We think that, you know, people go to heaven because we throw a lasso around them or, or toss a life ring to a man in the water who's drowning so, so that that man that is in the water doesn't die. When the truth of the, when the text tells us that he's already dead, he's a floating corpse. That's, if you want to use that illustration, man is spiritually dead. We, we saw that early on in, in our study in Romans. It'd be like throwing a life ring to a dead corpse floating on the water and expecting, you know, the guy to, <clears throat> you know, swim toward it. Why do we do that? We do that because we like making stuff up. We don't take God at his word. That they are born again from above by the will of God, not the will of man. John 1.13. That's what the text says. We don't want to believe that. People get mad when you tell them, you know, that the promise was absolutely certain to all the seed. They get mad at you. For telling them. And that is a verse of scripture. We've yet to reach the ninth chapter on divine election. I've had... People email me saying, Steve, can't wait till we get to the, the to the ninth chapter. We'll learn that there are no souls who are going to hell who ought to go to heaven. That's in chapter 9, yet that fact was clearly pointed out even in the early chapters of this epistle. There is no one going, you know, it, we're children of promise. What kind of a loving Heavenly Father do you think God is? Oh, that kid of mine, man, he's, 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 gonna he he's going to hell and I can't do anything about it. 
That, folks, is the God of modern Christianity. Not the God of this book. We know. We know absolutely that the whole creation is under the curse. But there is a grand and glorious deliverance. We know it. We know it because of the word of God. We know it because of the Lord Jesus Christ and his finished work. There isn't more that Christ is going to do for you folks. You are complete in him. Do you believe that? That's what the text says. You are wholly unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. That is what the text says. Do you believe? Do you believe God concerning that truth? That you stand without fault before him. What God tells us in his word is if we confess, 1 John 1, 9, if we confess, that is say the same thing about our sin that he says. Well, what has he said about our sin? He said it's forgiven, it's forgotten, it's washed away, it's buried in the depths of the sea, cast as far as the east is from the west, remember no more. And the context of that passage is what? The context of that passage regarding our agreeing with God concerning our sin is fellowship with Jesus Christ. We know, we know that there is a grand deliverance and not only all of creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit. First fruits of the Spirit is what the verse says. Now, you can read any number of uh, Bible scholars that tell you what the fruit or what the first fruits of the Spirit are in this text, this context. And normally they'll refer to Galatians, love, joy, peace, long, suffering, gentleness, meekness, faith, hope, temperance. Against such things there's no law. Uh, these are the first fruits. Believe me, you don't have part of the Spirit. The, the problem, I guess, is the concept of the first fruits. Now, most of you watchmen out there, you know what that is. Many of you who are, aren't watchmen, but you know, you've been following along with prophecy, you know what that is. Early before the harvest, you know, they're to bring the first fruits of the field and offer them to God. There was a uh, stipulated percentage in Jewish law, and this was the testimony of the great harvest that was to come. And so they take first fruits. And they say, you know, you got a little bit of the Spirit, and this is the indication of that which is to come. No, it's not that that's not true, but our, our present text, no, the Holy Spirit is the first fruits of that deliverance. That is the anticipation of not only the groaning creation, but the groaning us. You have the Holy Spirit, folks. He's a person. He's a person in the Godhead. He dwells within you. Not part of him dwells in you. All of him. You're not going to get more of him. One spirit, one faith, one baptism. The problem with modern Christianity is that it is always seeking more. It First of all, it doesn't even understand or believe or trust or or have knowledge of what God has already said. But, but you know, that's not good enough. They've got to have more. You know, neglecting what's already been given. You know, and mainly because it doesn't realize it's been given it. And that because they don't know this book. So, they're, you know, they're looking for something external and something more something extra something just give me something while well, all the time neglecting this book you're in you you are indwelt by the holy spirit if you're not you're you're not christ's we know that from the eighth chapter the glory of that promised deliverance is is evident to us it's visible to us because of the indwelling presence of the holy spirit who testifies with our spirit that we are 
children of God. If you think that if you think that indwelling presence is, is some kind of a static ex experience, some external experience that has to be manifested in some other way other than this book, folks. Well, I'll just go ahead and say it. You're caught up in a whole bunch of trash. The evidence, folks, of the Holy Spirit in your life is entirely proven by your acceptance of the Word of God. It's the Holy Spirit that says to you, that's true, that's true. Steve's, what Steve said is true, or what Steve said is not true. You know, that's right, that's wrong. Really, it, it really is easy to believe, you know, that certain things in the Bible are true. Nebuchadnezzar was king of Babylon. I got a brother who's not a believer. He believes that. He believes that. Any atheist will believe that. Just about. I mean, that's right. That That is a historical fact. But that is not the truth to which I refer. Even though, of course, it is truth. And folks, you can know all the Greek in the world and, and all, you can know all the Hebrew and Greek in the world and you can go straight to hell. I have wrestled with whether I should mention Greek because, or Hebrew, because I, I don't want anybody led into the trap that unless you know those things, unless you're a Greek scholar or a Hebrew scholar, that, that you can't understand the scriptures. That is not true. There's been many a poorly educated Christian, the babes in Christ, who know the scriptures better than many educated theologians. Trust me, I've, I've spent a lot of time around theologians. It isn't education. It's surrender to the leading of the Holy Spirit. It's a study of the book, not as, not as much a study of the language. I mean, I admit the tools help. I'm glad we have Strong's. I'm glad we have the interlinear. I'm glad we have commentaries. I'm glad we have all of that. I'm glad I know a little bit of Greek and, and a little bit of Hebrew. Well, virtually no Hebrew. Very little Hebrew. I mean, just to be fair. But I'm glad that the Holy Spirit dwells within me and I spend, I spend much more time meditating, pondering, even praying over a verse than I do studying it. And it is my absolute firm belief that not only can the Holy Spirit use the worst translation to enlighten one of God's children to the truth, not only can he do that, he does do that. We know, and we know it because of this book. Don't dream it up. Don't come, don't come to some conclusion that you think makes logical sense based upon human reasoning or human logic but search the scriptures to see what God has to say we know that there is a grand deliverance coming that we in the in the creation all of creation grown together travailing in birth pains until now the text says that that we in the creation suffer the pains of childbirth together not separate together and don't miss the word now there in the text for we are saved for hope for hope not by hope the original text literally states in this for hope we were saved the word is for you don't believe me look it up we're not saved by hope. We're saved by Jesus Christ. We were saved, is what the text says. It's an aorist active indicative. The aorist sees the action as a whole. The indicative is the mood of certainty. And the passive says, God did it. You didn't have anything to do with it. But, Hope that is seen is not hope. 
For what a man seeth, why doth he yet hope for? And I, I, I'll submit to you that if we were to walk outside and look up this minute and see the, you know, see heaven, it, it would actually be detrimental to our waiting for it. The text says, read it. The text says, but hope that is seen is not hope. The text is, is crystal clear. We would not have the blessed hope that we have if we were to walk outside, look up into the sky, and see the new Jerusalem hovering above our heads. As awesome as, you know, the sight as that would be. Verse 25. But if we hope for that which we see not, then do we with patience wait for it? Well, I read that, and, and what I gain from that text is the simple truth is that God and God declares that if we were to see our blessed hope with the with our eyeballs that are in our heads we would have neither hope nor patience that's what I get from the text and you know and I could preach an entire sermon on that suffice to say we walk by faith not by sight Dearly beloved, not just ourselves, but all of creation eagerly anticipates, awaits the revealing of the sons of God. That's us. The Spirit himself in us testifies to this marvelous truth. And no suffering, no suffering that we could ever possibly endure can in any way be compared to it is what the text is showing us a much needed passage for us at this time i believe given the fact that it's been so long since the revelation 12 sign and we're still here and we're so eager to go home that we still find ourselves here in this body oh wretched man i am at the present time but god promises us deliverance the now and the text clearly indicates that this will occur at God's appointed time. That's why I want you to take note of the word now. In, at which time we will receive everything Christ has. Why? Because we are joint heirs with Jesus Christ. Well, until next time, this is Steve. I love you all. I truly do. Thanks for watching.